from the Clarinetic Board of Directors. And uh, uh, for uh, on the Clarin side of things this afternoon, we also have uh, Juliana van der Leck and Giulia Pedolese. And we are very, very happy to welcome uh, uh, Nana, Sonia, and Anastas uh, from the Skills for EOSC uh, uh, project, who uh, will introduce us to this uh, methodology, uh, and in particular uh, will answer useful questions uh, for the clearing community to uh, as to how uh, we can go about uh, um, transforming and improving the quality, the reusability, the publication of our training materials. Uh, first and foremost, I will, would like to just give a very, very quick introduction to Clarin. Uh, many, some of you or many of you will already be familiar with it, but uh, just a reminder and maybe also uh, in a way explain why uh, we had we wanted to organize this, uh, this webinar. Uh, so indeed, uh, as you probably know, Clarin is a research infrastructure established uh, already in, since uh, 2006 and uh, is, uh, its aim is to um, offer easy and sustainable access for scholars in social sciences and humanities to uh, digital language data in written, spoken, video or multimodal form and as well as tools to discover, analyze, combine data wherever they are located. So it is a distributed infrastructure and whenever it's necessary and so that is to say that whenever the data requires and uh, um, authentica authentication, we also implement a single sign-on environment. But crucially for today's team, Clarin is also an infrastructure, an ecosystem for knowledge exchange, uh, because it is not possible to use, uh, make good use of this, uh, uh, this data, this infrastructure, without uh, having proper training. Um, Clarin, as man, as well, as alongside many other infrastructures, is now more and more integrated into the EOSC and that, therefore wants to adopt also practices and standards that are developed within the EOSC projects uh, such as Skills for EOSC. Um, this Clarin is an infrastructure basically for open science, so we promote the reuse of, of data, uh, data via data registries. Uh, the interoperability of data, fairness uh, via also fair certified repositories. And in a way, we think that by doing this, we will make uh, ensure that language resources, which are so crucial also uh, for today's technologies, can be reused across many languages, many disciplines. Uh, and in a way that is also um, I don't have to remind you about the fair principles. What I want to say is that, of course, um, we are an infrastructure that focuses on a certain type of data, language resources, but of course also the training materials that we produce, uh, the training on language resources that we produce, we want it to be fair as well. And that is why we approached also the uh, issues li linked to uh, fair methodologies uh, for the sharing of training materials. <clears throat> so, um, this is just to explain that uh, Clarin deals uh, with the, uh, this macroscope perspective, so not uh, the telescope, the infinite, which explores the infinitely great, or uh, the microscope that explores the infinitely small. And also Clarin is a complex infrastructure uh, spanning across uh, various uh, member countries and um, a number of centers. They are both data centers, data and services, but also knowledge centers. and. In those knowledge centers, also a number of training uh, activities are carried out. In, in short, Clarin uh, combines the metadata uh, on various types of language resources from a number of the centers that are um, federated and ha helps uh, the researchers to discover them and combine them with language tools, language processing tools that are compatible with this type of data. Two main core services of uh, Cla Central Clarin are the, on the one hand, therefore, the discovery service, so the virtual language observatory that uh, allows you to search uh, over across the metadata of all these centers, and the language resources switchboard where you can upload either 
uh, persistent identifiers or the resource itself, and a number of tools will be proposed for you to uh, process. We talk about different types of resource families in Clari. Uh, for instance, we have parallel corpora, spoken corpora, multimodal corpora, but also tools, lexical resources, and so on and so forth. Our uh, growing learning hub with uh, a section on core clearing uh, tra training materials that we want to make more and more modular, reusable, and fair. The resources that are provided by other centers, for instance, or um, trainers, uh, a trainer's network, and uh, also we are trying to uh, establish also guidelines, best practices, uh, share uh, information about workshops and also the Digital Humanities Quiz Registry, which is a joint, joint initiative also with Daria Eric and is aimed at uh, finding information about uh, academic uh, um, uh, training or uh, degrees. And uh, so it started, so uh, Juliana van der Leck actually uh, started to put together the uh, Clarin uh, training strategy in 2022. Um, thinking about also how to make our materials that were already available fair. And we got involved in a number of uh, debates, and, uh, such as the Open Air Community of Practice, Elixir, uh, Fair Training, EOS Working Group. And in 2023, indeed, uh, we, uh, we, were, uh, we, we discovered the skills were required by design method, and uh, we already proposed an adaptation at our Clarin Bazaar, at our conference. So uh, I think that this is all from us because we are actually here to learn from skills for EOS and to uh, deepen our knowledge of uh, uh, these topics. And just uh, to say that uh, you can get to know more about Clarin via a number of initiatives, the Clarin Cafes, our impact stories and the Clarin, and mostly, first and foremost, our news flash. There's also a trainers and educate training and education newsletter, um, sorry, mailing list that you can also subscribe to. Thank you very much. I think I'm unsharing my screen. And if I don't remember incorrectly, I am first handing it over to uh, Nana Anastasopoulou for uh, the introduction. Thank you very much to both projects for organizing this uh, workshop. Uh, my name is Nana Anastasopoulou from GRNet. I'm a task leader in skills for use. Uh, so, our project consists of 46 partners spread out in 18 European countries and uh, has uh, onboarded some uh, key doers in open science in their country and regional domain. Uh, it's a 7 million project, project funded by European Commission and has started in September 2022 and will last till uh, August 2025. Which is the main objective of Skills for EOSC? Uh, the main objective is uh, to advance open science skills by unifying uh, the current uh, training landscape into a common and trusted pan European ecosystem. We're trying to close the three gaps that were identified in the EOSC uh, strategic research and innovation agenda in 2021. And that means we are uh, trying to fill in the lack of open science and data expertise, the lack of clear definition on data professional profiles and corresponding career paths, and uh, the fragmentation in the training resources. So here we can see the correspondence between the three priorities regarding skills and training and the points in which uh, skills for use will contribute to such as the creation of the network of competence center, defining minimum viable skill sets, and uh, and more. So how do we do this? Uh, we have a set of key concepts. We have already developed uh, competence centers and the network, uh, the minimum viable skill set, the fair methodology about which you will hear more uh, in the next uh, presentation, the learning material and uh, the co-creation mechanism. Just here to say that uh, the concept of uh, the competence center is not new. It already exists in other more technical fields like the HPC and the, and the semiconductors. <clears throat> the project has, uh, has started with a discussion about what should uh, be the definition of a competence center in the context uh, of EOSC. So we believe that the CC, as we call it, uh, in the context of skills for use, should, re should represent a point of reference in a specific country region theme 
to find key competencies to enable the practice of open science with adequate knowledge of standards, applications, and tools, and best practicing, practices for delivering, managing, reusing, sharing, and analyzing fair data, as well as other digital research ob objects. So the CCs are built on competencies that people obtain and people are related to institutions and organizations. And they provide with their turn services in their respective communities, such as support or training, that are built on a set of resources and operational tools. So our project is trying to facilitate it, the creation of uh, the competence center, competence centers, as well as to build the network by providing these resources that can be used can be used by each one of them. Uh, moving on, uh, how do we support uh, the competencies harmonization at uh, European level and in the context of uh, EOSC for the outcomes of, uh, of the project? Um, skills for EOSC is a, a EOSC, of course, and an open science project. So we believe in applying open science practices uh, also in the methodology of our uh, internal work. All our outputs are produced by a co-creation mechanism when, try, when creating an initial version of an outcome that is shared with uh, the, the consortium or the, the community. Uh, so this is the methodology that we used uh, to define some of the key outputs of our project, uh, in particular what it's called the minimum viable skill set. Uh, it's uh, the way uh, with which the competencies for each uh, open science uh, uh, role is defined that we, are, we have identified uh, within the project. So we use the co-creation mechanism to define uh, the fair by design methodology for the training material uh, developed, uh, developed in our activities. Based on this material that, we, uh, that follows a set of rules, we will carry out train, uh, trainings for trainers that will enhance these uh, competencies inside um, the skills for ESC network. Uh, as a project, we are in line with the support of the European Competence Framework for Researchers that was issued by the European uh, uh, Commission uh, uh, by providing specific yields that are linked to the competencies uh, identified in this uh, framework. So uh, the minimum viable skill set, the MVS, is a tool that helps uh, defining skills for different roles. How does it do it? It creates a profile associated to one of the roles, for example, researcher, policymaker, and its profile is short and addresses the needs in terms of skills of each role, considering the open science mission and planned outcomes that are associated to this specific actor. For example, address the skills uh, uh, the need to summarize the uh, open science es essentials or provide high level guidance for curricula and uh, trainings. Uh, another important outcome is, of course, the fair by design methodology, but I will skip uh, the next slides because you will uh, hear more about it uh, from uh, Sonia and Anastas. Okay. Uh, Skills for EOSC goes beyond the fair by design methodology because one of the main objective is also to provide a fair aim work for uh, assurance and uh, certification. Uh, our project provides a collaborative, adaptable and inclusive framework focusing on uh, digital uh, skills and using existing technologies for recognizing competencies within the EOSC uh, ecosystem. This framework has been reported in one of the latest publications by European Commission in relation to skills. It's the researcher skills that was issued in April um, 2024. Uh, we have used this framework in one of the first training developed within the project. And again, you will hear more about it uh, in a while. <clears throat> uh, we uh, have also explored other tools of um, uh, accreditation. And one of these tools is the European Digital uh, uh, Credential. And it's important to say that people that will be acquiring uh, EDC from uh, skills for use training will automatically update their Europass uh, CV with competencies acquired through trainings. 
Um, we have checked the quality assurance framework for the material produced uh, in skills for use and the first iteration has been published. Uh, we have provided a reference uh, framework that ensures the quality of training materials and resources and it is based on uh, four key sub frameworks. Regarding the assessment of the material, it defines uh, attributes and questions for evaluation. It is applicable to skills for use and other open science uh, resources. The methodology that we have uh, developed presents essential elements, best practices, and evaluation frameworks, and to initiate broader stakeholder um, discussion. The concept of uh, lifelong learning through peers uh, that skills for use has developed is an important part of our project, as we believe that the uh, competencies and skills uh, need to be continuously updated through the pro professional life of an actor. So we are trying to create a mechanism that can support a lifelong uh, learning through the network of the peers. Uh, for this, uh, it has been successfully, uh, a fellowship program has been successfully developed that is unlocking opportunities in open science and fair data. Uh, it is based on the concept that experts that are based in one institution can be hosted by other institutions in Europe to exchange the practical way of working uh, in some contexts and learn through, um, through each other. Um, so uh, as I said before, skills for usc has uh, built a coordination uh, uh, network of competence center for, uh, for CCs, uh, for open science, for principles and AUSC in Europe. And uh, we call them and the CCNet. One might ask, what uh, do this competence center do? They are dedicated to knowledge organization and transfer in the open science, uh, fair research output management, and EOSC context. They represent a node for key competencies in a specific country or region, and they serve as a reference point for knowledge on open science standards, tools, fair data, and other digital outputs. Um, so, uh, in order to, uh, so maybe, okay, sorry, I may have skipped something. Yeah, our network balances diversity and harmonization. Uh, the Skills for Years Competence Center uh, vary very widely depending on the country, region, or domain they operate in. Um, Yet the Skills for Years Coordination Network uh, ensures harmonization and alignment at uh, European level. So this is the network uh, structure, which is designed to maximize the impact and reach. E its competence center is connected to the broad network and simultaneously uh, connected to, to local professional and user support networks. This way, we ensure that there is an efficient flow uh, on open science skills and knowledge from a European level down to individual researchers and professionals. In order to achieve the visibility of our network, we have created a competence centers registry, which is regularly, uh, regularly, like, regularly updated. Uh, once the identified competence center have attained an appropriate level of maturity and have joined a uh, uh, skills for EOSC by adopting the outcomes and participating in uh, the training of trainer uh, course, courses. Uh, here you see in the right part <coughs> of uh, the slide, the currently included uh, competent center in uh, Italy, Greece, Finland, Sweden, North Macedonia, and France. And on the left side, you may see a list of, uh, of those that uh, are uh, under discussions of uh, joining the network. At this point, uh, I would like to show you that the key component of our strategy is the train of trainers program. So uh, the master trainers of each competence center are, tra are trained by the skills for years community through specialized uh, sessions. After completing these trainers, the master trainer commits to sharing best practices and lessons learned with their local community trainers. And this uh, creates a multi-layer effect on rapidly spreading open science skills and knowledge um, across Europe. Uh, currently, uh, we are ready to publish and uh, disseminate uh, broadly uh, the final train of trainers program, which will soon start uh, during this, uh, this autumn. 
As you see here, uh, the program covers a wide range uh, of topics crucial for advancing uh, open science, such as science for policy, ethical and legal uh, implication on open science, courses for undergraduates, and uh, some specialized, specialized courses for researchers in different fields and even an open science um, communities uh, incubator. So the Competence Center Network brings a variety of added values to the European research landscape, like fostering collaborative uh, solutions and best practices, uh, developing harmonized and certified curricula for diverse open science roles, making learning materials and training accessible, uh, and, uh, the coordination and the networking, and influencing national open science policy uh, roadmaps. Uh, we are preparing now the first in-person competence center network that will pay, take place uh, just before the uh, EOSC symposium uh, in uh, Berlin. And uh, also, um, uh, we're happy about the upcoming uh, conference session with the title Open Science Competence Center in the EOSC and uh, beyond that we have submitted with some other projects. In conclusion, our future steps include uh, the train of trainers' uh, activities, uh, strengthening the competence center network, the continuous engagement uh, with the uh, EOSC partnership and projects, and uh, start a sustainability discussion involving relevant actors and EOSC partnership to ensure the long-term uh, impact of our network and selecting a set of uh, interoperable IT services facilitating the competence center uh, alignment. So thank you very much. I understand it might be too compact information. And if you have any question, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Let's officially start with the topic of the training today, uh, which is the FAIR by design methodology or how to develop uh, FAIR materials. First, I want to say hello to everyone. Uh, I don't know many of you, so my name is Sonia Filiposka. I come from the St. Cyril Methodius University from North Macedonia, but I come here in the role of uh, task leader for the FAIR by Design Methodology task and skills for us, as you heard before from Nana. Our goal is to give you the information about the FAIR by Design methodology, how you can use it in practice, to show you how we are using it inside uh, skills for us, so that you can adopt it and adapt it to, to your needs and to your purposes, because uh, the point is that every organization, uh, every consortium like uh, you, Klein, can uh, adapt it and can use their own tools in order to produce fair materials. What's the idea behind the fair by design methodology? Why create fair learning materials, right? Well, um, this is because in the end, you need to practice what you preach. I remember the first time when I went to an open science training and someone was, it was a workshop, so, so they were presenting some materials, we were doing some activities and so on. And the first question that came to me as a professor, one that is dealing with training materials every day is, wait a second, I heard so much about this FAIR data, but are these materials that we are doing the training with FAIR by themselves, right? So we need to also make these materials FAIR. And by making the learning materials fair, you actually show other people that, yes, you can do everything fair. And if you invest a little bit uh, of your time, you can actually implement the fair principles to every type of data that uh, is being produced. Uh, also, if you are having fair learning materials, that means that it's very easy to build a community of uh, instructors, of uh, trainers that can share the materials, that can improve them, make them better, because as they are being reused, their quality actually increases because everybody is going to improve them, up to date, uh, um, update the content, add something more, change a, a typo or something, whatever. And this uh, helps in the end to, to uh, use uh, very high quality learning materials. So by persisting and using fair learning materials, you actually are able to spread the fairness of everything in, in the research world. When we are talking about fair learning materials, one of the first points that you have to keep in mind is that the fair by design methodology aims to make the materials fair from both the learners and the instructor's point of view. And these two views are a little bit different, right? So if you put yourself in the role of a learner, 
And you think about fair learning materials, it means that I should be able to find them very easily. I should be able to access this content in order to learn what I want to learn from it. I should uh, be using any type of common tool like a browser viewer, whatever, to, to be able to, to consume this content. And then I should be able to reuse it in the sense of revisit, reread, uh, rewatch the content at any, at any point. However, if you now put yourself in the shoes of a trainer or an instructor and say, okay, what is fair learning material? Well, it's a bit different, right? Because yes, you want to find it easily, but when you say access it, you mean I want to access it in its editable version because most probably I will need to change something. Maybe I need just a little piece. Maybe I need to add something. Maybe I need to update some content because now it's uh, already obsolete or it's old or, or something new happened. So I need it in an editable version. I need to repurpose it for, for my own context, for whatever I need to do. And in this way, we use it to, to provide other trainings or to provide it for other learners. And also I need to do it uh, in a way that is according to the licensing terms, because everything that we produce, we produce it together with a license. And of course, we need to respect this license when we are reusing material. So we try to do FAIR by design with both of these views in mind. The idea is that if you follow the FAIR by design methodology to produce learning materials, you will get FAIR learning materials that are FAIR for both the learners and the instructors. The first thing that you need to be aware of is that if you want to make something fair, of course, it requires a bit more effort from the side of the one that prepares the materials, right? It requires more time. Why does it require more time? Because in order to make stuff fair, you need to think about a lot of additional things like uh, adding metadata that is readable by both machines and humans adding persistent identifiers, choosing the right repositories, adding uh, clear licenses for reusing. If you are reusing material, adding attribution for every reuse that you did, choosing the right file formats and the tools so that everything is open and reusable easily by others. So all of this requires a little bit more effort, but it is worth it. Why? Because in the end, what you produce is fair and it's easily reusable by your team, by other teams, so that it can be spread in the community. In order to do it most effectively, the idea is to start thinking about FAIR from the beginning. Because if you produce all of the learning material, and then in the end you say, ah, OK, I want to make them FAIR, then this will mean going back to the beginning and going, redoing many of the steps in order to make the material FAIR. If you think about fair from the start, so you think fair by design, then you will be able to introduce the fair concepts right in the places where you need to, to do it so that in the end, your work is fair and you can share it with, share it with others. Basically to do it fair means to think about different details while you're working on the materials. So one of the main examples that we use is for an example, Many times when you say training learning materials, people think slides. Okay, I will make a bunch of slides and that's it. I will share it with the community. However, it, that's not it. Why? Because if you share your slides with me, right? I'm, I'm a different instructor. I'm a different trainer. I need to, to redo the training. They tell me, okay, tomorrow you need to do the same training as done by this person because he or she is sick and you need to replace him. And they give me the bunch of slides. I didn't do the slides, so when I see the slides, I see a bunch of bullets, but I don't really have the idea on what was said, when, where is the point, how I should use the slides, and so on. That's where the instructor kit comes into play. So we say that if you use the fair by design methodology, you need to augment this learning content with additional files that are going to help the instructors reuse it we use the materials in a way that it will be easier for them, right? So if I have a document that says, okay, this is the background of the slides, this is the place where you need to put the focus on, you need to spend this uh, amount of minutes on this, you need to do this kind of activity between this and this section in the slides in order to make it more interactive and so on, it's much easier for me to actually 
consume and reuse this, this comp. This is the idea of the instructor kit. So everything that I've been telling you about so far is actually put inside into this fair by design methodology process that is actually based on the backward instructional design process. The backward instructional design process is one of the, let's say, most popular instructional design processes that are meant to develop learning material. We changed this process a little bit in order to add inside it steps that are going to ensure that we follow the FAIR principles from both the learners and the peer instructors. And what you see here are the stages of the FAIR by design methodology, which we defined using the backward instructional design process empowered with the FAIR, with the FAIR principles. In this uh, beginning of the training, we are going to discuss a little bit about every, uh, every step, every stage of the process so that you get the general idea of what is done in the fear by, according to the fear by design methodology, what is expected from the person that is developing the material in each of these stages and what do you get in the, what do you get in the end? So we have prepare, where we prepared for the content, we think about what we want to do, we have discovered, try to find already existing materials, not to start from scratch, to reuse something, design, decide what we are going to reuse, what we are going to develop by ourselves, how we are going to structure the whole thing, produce, actually develop the content, develop the material, publish, provide the content you developed to both learners and instructors, Verify, check for quality insurance, make sure everything is okay. Start gathering feedback in order to implement um, co-creation and uh, improve the content. Provide the training if you are aiming for a training or put it online if it's a self-paced uh, learning content. And then you gather the feedback, analyze the feedback, decide that uh, this is something that needs to be improved. You go back and you start again producing a new version of the learning material. This is the idea in a nutshell. Now let's see step by step what you need to do in each of the stages to make sure that what you produce is going to be fair in the end. Of course, in the prepare stage, if you don't know what fair is, you need to learn about it, right? But I know that all of you in the community are very well about the fair principles, so I'm sure that this is easy for you. One special thing about the FAIR, the metadata feeds and so on, is the use of metadata schema, right? Because we say the metadata is, is perfect, it's complete and everything, if it follows a correct metadata schema. Now, the question is, what is the correct metadata schema for learning materials? And this is not an easy question to answer because there is no, no right answer. It depends on, on, on many things. Um, what we do inside the FAIR by Design methodology is that we adopt that the RDA, Minimum Metadata Schema, that has been recently published, as the minimal metadata schema that you are supposed to use for your learning materials. What does it mean? It means that you need to describe your learning materials using the fields inside this RDA metadata schema. And Anastas is going to tell you about it more after me. But you can actually, if you want, extend it with more fields so that you can adapt it to your community, right? Because uh, Clarin has a focus on, on language and ontologies and stuff like that. You might need more fields, right? And this is quite okay. This is great. So you will, you will even make the metadata more rich. The only thing that you need to, to make sure is that you have all of the fields of the minimum metadata schema, and then you provide additional fields and you create your own extension for your own community. This is the first step. Now that you have the schema, you know what schema you're going to use. The rest of the stuff in the prepare stage says like this, okay, we are going to develop learning materials that we call fair learning objects. What is a fair learning object? Well, we say that the minimum material that you can make fair is actually a package that needs to contain at least one learning objective or learning outcome. What do you want to achieve with this learning material? The content of the material, plan how to deliver the material by the instructor, by the trainer, 
description of an interactive activity or whatever you, you plan for the learners to do while they consume the content. Assessment in the end to check if, if they actually achieved the learning objective. And facilitation guides that helps the instructor deliver the training, what to do before, what to do during, what to do after the training. So this whole package will be one fair learning object that then you can put in a repository, you can assign a bit to it, you can share it and, and you reuse it with, with others. Once we have these two things clear, now we can start the process. We are starting the backward instructional design process. How do we start the backward instructional design process? Well, its name already tells you what you need to do. You think about the learning outcomes. So what do you want to achieve with this training? And then you work backwards. You say, okay, I want these learning outcomes. How do I get to these learning outcomes? Well, I need to know how am I going to check whether the learners have actually achieved these learning outcomes. So the next, the next thing you think about is actually the assessment. Once you have an idea of what kind of assessment you're going to use, then this is actually going to tell you how to structure the material, what kind of content do you need to provide to the learners in order to be able to pass the assessment and achieve the, the learning objectives. This is how the, the backward instructional design process works. You start it, you think about it, and we said, okay, the first thing you think about is actually the learning outcomes, right? When you develop learning materials, you describe the learning outcomes as learning objectives, what you would like the people to achieve in the end, right? So you think about organizing, uh, defining the learning objectives, but these learning objectives depend on many things. For an example, what is the target audience? Is it uh, people that already have experience with this? Is it like a beginner level, an expert level? Um, may, are there any prerequisites? Do you expect them to know something and then improve on their skills or you expect them to know nothing? What is the scope of the learning objectives? What do you want to achieve? And, and these kinds of things. This is what you need to decide in the prepare stage. So at the end of the prepare stage, you know, the purpose of your learning materials, target audience, the prerequisites, the scope, and you have a list of one or more learning objectives depending on the size of your size of your content. Anastas is going to talk to you more about defining the learning objectives using the Bloom's taxonomy, so I will not spend too much time on this here. This is just a visual representation of the backward instructional design in case uh, it's something new to you, although I think it's not and you have been using it before, but basically these are the three steps that we were talking about, right? So in prepare, we were doing determine goals and objectives. Now we are going to move on towards planning assessment and planning learning, learning activities. Of course, when you are defining, designing learning materials, nobody wants to start from scratch. Right, especially if this is a topic that has been already trained, there is already content on it and so on. That's why uh, our second stage in the Fair by Design methodology is actually the discover stage. You want to see what is out there. Maybe you can reuse some of the material. You can reuse it if it's available under a permissible license. If it's not available under a permissible license, then you can at least use it as an inspiration and see. Uh, what, what you can develop that is maybe similar to this or, or whatever. There are many places that actually serve as repositories for learning materials. For the acquiring community, maybe the best place to start looking for something is actually the acquiring learning hub or the SSH open marketplace or a dairy campus or upskilled learning content. If you don't find the content that you're looking for there, maybe try an open educational resource repository like Mello, Oasis, Galileo, Ford, and so on. Or if it is something related to EOSC, maybe you can also try the learning platforms from many EOSC projects because almost every EOSC project has developed learning content for their own, for their own purposes. At this point, the EOSC training catalog on the EOSC marketplace is not very stable, so maybe you cannot really access it, but I hope that in the future 
uh, it will also be accessible and it will be a place to, to find resources. Of course, don't forget about uh, general repositories because there is a lot of uh, stuff there to, to find. Uh, so Zenodo, SF, but also the Creative Commons repository is a very good place to, to actually search for, for materials. In Zenodo, for an example, there is a category and you can filter uh, according to categories. You can choose category lesson and it will give you a list of uh, a lot of learning materials and then you can do a keyword search. This is also a nice uh, uh, stage where you can search for multimedia because when you create content, don't forget that the learners on the other side, they have different modalities, right? Some like to read more, some like to listen more, some like to watch videos. So you also need to provide this kind of content. And there are different repositories that provide uh, free content with attribution that you can reuse. You've seen what is out there. You chose what you want to reuse. You got inspired. Great. Now is the time to design your learning materials. The first thing that you need to do is define the concept. What do we mean by concept? Well, we mean you sit down and you use a piece of paper and you create like a map of the things that you want to put inside your learning materials. It's like the first step. Try to visualize your ideas. Based on this, after a few drawings here and there, you will be able to actually prepare the syllabus. And the syllabus will be all of this information. Who is this for? What are the objectives? What is the initial structure of your, of your learning materials? Make sure that the structure is granular enough so that you pinpoint the places that you are going to reuse and say, oh, okay, I found this, I will reuse it here. Ah, but for this part, I didn't find anything. I will develop it by, by myself, right? And the places where you can reuse, you use something with permissible licenses, you check if you can mix different contents with different licenses. We will talk about this more later. For the places that you need to develop, you need to develop content and instructor kit for this content. So that means you need to develop slides, notebook, activities, assessments, like quizzes, strategy for doing the assessment, learning unit plan, how this is going to be delivered, but also facilitation guide. This is going to help other trainers deliver the content, see what they need to do before and after the training. And don't forget, of course, to think about designing a feedback form because in the end, you need to get feedback about what your learning material and go into the cycle of improving the, improving the learning material. At the end of the design stage, you have all of this structure, all of these files, this content that needs to be developed, everything that you decided that you're going to reuse. Now you go into produce and you start actually filling out the content that you're missing according to the structure that you defined. Here, you choose the tools that you're going to use for, um, for creating the content and you choose the file formats. Make sure you use open file formats so that in the end, they are interoperable. Somebody else can reuse them. You can use any types of tools you want. If they are open and free, great. If they are not, you just need to provide the information, okay, to work with these files. You need to use these tools so that someone else that reuses the content knows what to, what to do. Be careful here when we are talking about file formats, we are talking about two different file formats. The first uh, group is editable files, right? These are the files that you are creating. These are the files that you want to share with other instructors so that they can reuse them and adapt them to their purposes. For the learners, you have the group of final file formats. These are the files that you share with the learners and it should be easy for them to use them, not to use expensive tool to open them and things like this. While you're producing the material, one of the things you need to be careful about is to make them accessible, right? To create learning content that is covering the widest range of learners that use or don't use assistive technology. And there are a few standards that we're going to talk about that ensure that your content is, is accessible. And this is not like a one straight street, right? You touch here, you touch there, you go back, you improve, 
So it's a bit of a cycle while you're working inside this inside this stage. Don't forget that while you're creating the content, you also need to create the metadata and you need to also provide information inside the instructor kit. At the end of the produce stage, you say, okay, I'm done, but let's see if I'm truly done, right? So you do an internal quality assessment. You check by yourself if you have all of the required elements, if everything you wanted is inside each of the learning units that you, that you produced. For an example, uh, the way we use the fair by design methodology for the editable content, we use markdown and we use uh, PowerPoint um, slides. The final content is actually presented in Git pages and PDF documents. And uh, we use GitHub in order to ensure that we have a collaborative environment with granular versioning, especially when multiple people are working as a team together to produce the, the content. The content is produced, you have it. It's done, according to the structure, everything is great, ready to be published, not yet. Now you are in the published stage, but you need to make the final preparations. What are the final preparations? Well, these are accompanying files that you need to put together with your content in order to make sure that everything is as it should be. For an example, a readme file that describes the content and makes it easy for other people to understand what is where and how to reuse it. A citation file that tells other people how to attribute to you, how to cite you and say, ah, okay, I, I use this content. I reuse something from this content. A code of conduct file that says, yes, we can collaborate together. These are the rules under which you can actually provide more content inside these learning materials and maybe other files that you would like to, to use as well. Once you do these files, you're ready to put the editable content into a learning repository. It would be great if you choose a fair repository, but this is not mandatory and repository will, will do. And after you put it into a repository, the next step is to put it into a catalog as well. This might be done automatically if the repository is harvested. In some cases, you need to do it manually and put it in a catalog like the SSH Open, open Cloud. Putting it in the repository, this is for the editable files, right? So that they can be reused by learners, uh, by, by instructors. For the content to be used by learners, you need to put it on the place that is going to be available for learners. Is it going to be a learning management system? Is it going to be a simple website like we did it for, for this training? It depends on you and whatever you, you decide. But this is basically the final content that is seen by the learners, right? You might, if it's a learning management system, you also might need to do steps like create a quiz, set up feedback gathering, put a link to a webinar room. If you want to do the recognition framework, then you need to also define the badge, certificate, the rules, how they're going to be received and uh, things like that. After you do the published stage, you're not done, I'm afraid. You have to do a verification. What does it mean to do a verification? First, you need to check, okay, is it really fair? I did my best, right? I put it, I published it and everything, but let's check. Did I do everything fair? Maybe I missed something. So there is a QA checklist that we prepared for you and we will talk about it more in the second session where you have a list of questions and based on this, you, will, you, you can define your level of fairness. And there are some points that are required. Without this, you're not fair. And there are some points like nice to have. If you have it, then you're more fair. If you don't have it, then you're less fair. The other thing that is also recommended is external quality assurance. So ask someone else that wasn't involved in the process to take a look at your learning content and they can give you feedback. Also check if everything is fine from the learner perspective, right? And then start gathering the feedback, start analyzing the feedback so that you can actually do another, another iteration. So we did a very short intro of every of the stages inside the FAIR by Design methodology. I hope you're still with me and you're still following, but let's see how much you followed up to now. So based on what I was telling you about, there is just one question I would like to ask you. And that is about the accessibility when we are talking about fear by design learning materials. 
Anastas is going to help me here and provide the answers to the questions in the chat. And you can answer by providing reactions to every answer you think is correct. I will give you a hint that there are more than one correct answers. So you try and choose the correct answers by doing a thumbs up or other type of reaction to the A, B, C, Ds that Anastas provided. I'm sorry when I share the screen, I cannot see the chat, but that's why I have my uh, training companion here to help me and tell me how is it going, are people answering, and who is the winner so far? Well, we have lots of A's, and we have several C's, uh, a couple of... Uh, uh, D also has some answer, but I think the A is the most favorable answer so far chosen by by our participants so sonia please okay if a was the best choice let's call it we are on the right track so provide access to metadata for everyone is actually one of the rules in fair right this is what is accessible in in fair principles however when we are talking about learning materials here also C is the correct answer. So make materials accessible for different learner types is actually uh, very important for learning materials. And that's why we say that the FAIR by design methodology expands the meaning of accessibility in the FAIR principles and also includes this aspect. I'm a bit disappointed that nobody was paying attention to B because this is also a correct answer because yes, you are supposed to provide access to the materials for, for learners and uh, access is part of the FAIR principles, but maybe it was too easy for you and you thought that that's why it's not, it's not correct. Uh, for the final one, for D, make open materials uh, without any cost. This is actually one step beyond FAIR, okay? So if you may make the materials fully open and free for everyone, that's great. Wonderful. I, I really appreciate you and I really respect you. However, pay attention that based on the definitions of the FAIR principles, it's not mandatory that the materials need to be fully open and free. What is mandatory by FAIR is that the metadata is made fully open and free and accessible for everyone. Then you might need to pay to actually access the content of the learning of the learning materials. Okay, let's give it another try and see what do you think the repository record should contain. In this case, we have only one correct answer. So far, C is the most uh, frequently chosen options, although I have a couple of A's. Okay. I actually thought that you're going to respond in this way, and we can discuss this in the Q&A at the end. Uh, what is recommended by the FAIR by Design methodology is actually A, so in the repository record to include only the editable files for instructors. Why? Because we said the, uh, the content for the learners should actually be provided in the final files on a platform that will make it accessible for learners. We don't really want you to mix these two together in a record. Why? Because it's very, very hard to keep track that they are both in sync, right? For an example, imagine that the final file format is PDF and the editable files are actually, let's say, slides, right? So I make one change in one word in the slides and then I need to print to PDF to make sure that the slides are in sync with the PDF and put them in as a new version in the repository record. It's a lot of work and it's prone to a lot of human errors. So that's why we say in the repository record, you should keep the editable files. Whenever you need them, you have a training tomorrow, let's say. So you need to provide the the content to learners. This is the moment when you get the, the latest version of the editable files, you create the final files and you provide it to the, to the learners. But don't keep them in the same record because it might uh, confuse you and they, might, they can easily get out of sync. This is the only reason why we don't really uh, recommend it. However, it's up to you. I mean, it's not like mandatory or something. It's always open to, to uh, what's the word, <laughs> to, 
to to, ad to adaptation to the environment in which you're working, right? Depending on the tools that you use, etc. In the end, don't forget that uh, verify is not actually the final stage of the fair by design methodology, because if you remember in verify, we collect the feedback and there are multiple types of feedback. It can be internal, external. We will talk about this more in the second session. However, the idea is to analyze this feedback, create a list of potential improvements, and then repeat the process of the fair by design methodology and now produce a new improved version of the learning materials. And even your team of instructional designers might actually grow because there might be someone else in the community interested to work on these learning materials together, together with you. If you really want a deep, deep dive into all of these stages of the fair by design methodology, then you can try check out the git book on this first link that you see here. If you want to get a certification, a badge that says, yes, you are a fair by design instructor, then please visit the course on the skills for risk learning management uh, platform, do the assessments and everything, and you will get the badge in the end. And of course, there are the Git pages and the Git repo so that you, so you can see how the final versions and the editable versions look like for one of the training materials that we developed based on the fair by design methodology. With this, we did a bird course <laughs> through the stages of the fair by design methodology. Now for the rest of this session, we are going to focus on the first stages. So we will focus on prepare, we will focus on design and uh, produce. In the second session of the training, we will talk more about publication and verification access. Now I'm giving the floor to Anastas to talk to you about the first actions that we need to do. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, let me share my... Uh... First presentation, I will have two actually consecutive uh, presentations in this part. And uh, the first one will be the one uh, regarding the metadata, the controlled vocabularies, the syllabus and the learning objectives. And then we'll continue with the next one right after that before the, the, the break. So uh, the idea here is to say a few more words than Sonia said already about the, the metadata, uh, but also the controlled vocabularies that are very frequently used to fill in the metadata, the metadata fields, and then turn toward the syllabus elements and the learning objective, of course. Uh, I think you all understand the importance. You all work with uh, uh, complex data set, especially in the clearing community. And the metadata is of huge, huge importance to you to describe the resources, the huge heterogeneous complex resources. I like the picture with the microscope and the telescope at the same time uh, in the introductory presentation. So uh, you all are very aware of why metadata is, is important. It's a key ingredient to make these learning resources to satisfy at least at least uh, three of the four FAIR principles, the findable, the accessible, and the reusable ones. They are mostly, they, they, are, they, they base themselves on the, on, the, on the metadata that you use to describe, explain, and uh, that, that help you describe, explain, and locate these resources. It's very helpful to use the metadata because by using it, you will help instructors, the fellow instructors, to find the information on the learning resources, to see if they these materials are fit to the purpose, are, uh, are actually the ones that they would like to use, and of course, to discover how to use these learning, learning resources. Um, the metadata, as we already mentioned, it uses the, the uh, RDA, minimal metadata for learning resources. The RDA has a special interest group that has uh, worked on this matter and, and uh, developed this, uh, this set of uh, required metadata for the learning resources. They are divided into three groups, the descriptives, there are six of them the access uh, uh, fields and the educational fields. As you can see, 
uh, some of them are quite quite uh, quite uh, self-explainable by themselves. If you look at the 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 the, the, the them the the abstract or the authors or the language that is used, some of them might not be uh, sound that so self-explainable at the at the at the first at the first look. But then you have the the links and the explanations of all these fields of the. The RDA metadata, both in the in the in the slide, but also in the learning materials in the Git pages produced for this, for this, uh, for this um, uh, training. So please consult them. And our advice is to try to use this material, try to use this field, try to populate these fields as as exactly as you can, because this way you will be providing lots of help to the others, to the other instructors to, that will be using this training materials, but also provide provide valuable information to the learners at the same at the same time. Some of these fields, uh, in general, some of the fields in in metadata are are uh, are expected to be filled with a uh, with the predefined set of values and then there come the controlled vocabularies to help us to help both humans and machines to categorize the information to avoid the duplication to avoid errors uh, whenever we have something that needs to be filled with predefined values and this is true especially for the metadata elements we should use a controlled vocabulary we use them a lot within the within the skills for eos project for example we use controlled vocabulary a lot when describing the minimum minimum vi viable skill set of of eos here are some of the examples but the clarin community is also is also very familiar with the with the uh with the um, um controlled vocabularies these are just few examples of controlled vocabularies that i found in the social and the uh, social, uh, social sciences and humanities vocabulary commons, uh, SCOMOS instance, uh, for example, the, the intended audience or the status of training resources from the training discovery kit or from the service description, the taxonomy for linguistics objects, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so once we figure out the, the 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 metadata and we use wherever we can the control vocabularies to be more precise and more exact in the filling of this metadata, we should turn turn to the to the syllabus, um, the 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 sequence of learning concept that will be be turning into uh, into an instructional sequence or agenda of your of your training. It's the blueprint for the organization of the learning materials and for the definition of of the syllabus and it's important that that the syllabus provides information regarding several very important elements that we'll be presenting in the next slide and the elements of the syllabus include um elements such as uh, that are quite quite self-explanatory like the title or the date and time or the location of the training but also the type meaning would it be a course is it intended to be delivered as a workshop or maybe it's a it's a webinar the location can be a physical location or a link to the to the uh, virtual room uh, where the training will be will be uh, will be uh, delivered the target audience description the expertise level expected from the target audience is it a beginner intermediate advanced level of of uh, of uh, of uh, training the primary language that will be used the access cost we mentioned the cost uh, of the access to the materials again it does not need to be it, it's not mandatory to be uh, free but it, if it's in any case it should be noted in the syllabus elements are there as access costs associated with this with this training do we expect some prerequisites from the audience uh, the duration of the training the training objectives uh, the contributors to this training the authors and of course the trainers that will be delivering the training um, i'm skipping through these fields because there are lots of them and you will get familiar to them if you go diving deeper into the into the methodology contact information is crucial because if someone wants to further contact the 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 uh, the authors or the trainers of the of the course of course persistent identifier and uh, accessibility mission accessibility 
is becoming more and more important in today's society to to say uh, what kind of of commitment does your community have toward the accessibility of the documents to all the categories of all the possible categories of 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 learners. Uh, it's very important to keep it in mind that the syllabus can be presented at a very high level sequence, which then can be broken into smaller subtopics if necessary, if we, if we have the need for it, should define so that the concepts are introduced gradually, which means that the, the ones introduced earlier may be referenced later and, and, and encountered later during the, the, the training. The agenda must not be very rigid, preventing uh, that that would prevent any changes in the sequence of topic. Please keep it as loose as possible because sometimes it's very dependent on the on multiple factors that you cannot even predict before delivering the training on how the 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 actual the actual training will develop. And it's good idea to send the syllabus to the learners and make them familiar with uh, with the with these what what is contained there, so they will be. Uh, better prepared when it comes to the actual training training delivery. And the next topic that we will discuss in this one is the defining the learning objective. So one, now we have the, the 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 syllabus and we go a little bit deeper to define the learning the learning objectives. It's important that we use the smart approach toward the describing the the new knowledge and the skills that will be obtained by by this by this training and by smart we mean that the, all the learning objective will be very specific would be quite easy to be measured will be attainable so they will stick with the 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 learners will be relevant and of course time bound if you take the first letters it spells smart smart um, learning objectives there are helpful tools that can help you to define these learning objectives we have uh, opted for the Bloom's taxonomy to ensure that we have a standardization and we have a wider understanding of the of the learning objective. And Bloom's taxonomy can be quite helpful. There are different different represent different uh, representations, different quite visual representations of the Bloom's taxonomy. And it's always in 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 our experience, it's always good to keep handy a picture like this, an image like this that can uh, remind you of first of all what level of knowledge do you want to 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 get with this with this training so from lower order training skills to a higher end training skills and for each of these levels of training skills there are very nice verbs object learning objective verbs that should be used to define the 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 learning objectives uh, the the idea of using the smart objectives is there to avoid using vague um, objectives. Objectives that actually don't mean much cannot be easily measured or cannot be easily identified as 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 such. Uh, and that would be the the short version of this. And before we go away, of course, I would uh, uh, also like to to see a couple of uh, to see what's your opinion. On 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 some of the things that we already mentioned here, and couple of couple of questions for you. The first one being, which of the following elements are expected to be in a syllabus? So, is target audience, assessment strategy, purpose, duration, and feedback questions. So, the target audience is very important to be mentioned in the syllabus because you know who to who who uh, you you know who to expect, and they the target audience knows what to expect from this. Um, the purpose is also very important, and of course, the duration. You have to put a, a a time limitation of this. Assessment strategy and feedback questions are will be discussed a little bit later during this, but they are not necessarily a part of the of the syllabus and just another question for for you which of the followings are considered good learning objectives especially having in mind uh, the the bloom's taxonomy uh, sorry anastas if i may uh, i think you mentioned that the assessment strategy is not mandatory but if you would think of a course in the university context probably that would be have to be mentioned in the syllabus 
Yes, of course, of course. It very much depends. It very much depends on the on the constant. You're right. You're absolutely right. If you look at it from the point of view of academic, or if you look at it from the point of view of any formal recognition of the course, and we will discuss the recognitions, I think, uh, later in the, or to, uh, later in this in this uh, training. It's yes, of course. The 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 assessment strategies should be should be part of the of the syllabus. You're right. Yeah, and especially in Clarin, in Clarin, we we develop uh, and we organize trainings in academic context and also summer schools. So um, it's important to to mention that the way we would. Thank have... you, thank you for noting it. Thank you. Just look at the the verb that that starts the the sequence. Differentiate. It's a quite strong statement. Differentiate between good and bad learning objectives. That's what we're trying to do with this question or explain the RDA metadata field means that you will have gained a knowledge that will uh, explain which of the the meaning of the, the fields. Using verbs that are understand or know are quite vague and not not recommended by the by the Bloom's taxonomy or by the smart um, way. So we should be avoiding that kind of a uh, vague vague verbs or vague statement of of learning objectives so thank you for the for the for the answers uh, just to summarize we have mentioned that we opted for the rda metadata schema for the learning resources some of these uh, elements are based on the control vocabularies and they are quite important not only for the metadata, but especially for the metadata where we have some kind of uh, involvement of machine readable objects and we want to minimize the possibility of the of the errors. We discussed a little about, about the syllabus elements and defining of smart learning objectives. So that was for this first presentation from my side. I, sorry, I forgot Sonia's email here in the last slide. But anyway, if you contact, uh, she is the main contact for, for this. Thank you. And the next presentation refers to the to the facilitators, uh, facilitators kit. Uh, so here in this one, we'll talk a little about, about the instructors, uh, in the instructors kit that we, that we proposed to be part of this of this uh, of the learning materials uh, but we also discuss here the structure um, the structure of the whole learning materials we uh, propose a structure within the methodology that helps better organize the materials then we go a little bit deeper in the learning unit plan which means planning the delivery of the timely planning of the delivery of the of the of the uh, training the learning content and at the end the uh, facilitation the facilitation guide so uh, each instructor kit the kit that was meant to 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 support fellow instructors or uh, people that will be you that will be delivering courses should have several important elements within self. Uh, uh, it's much easier when you develop your material and do the training by yourself, but that's always not always the case, especially in the larger communities. We see a lot of examples that we have designers that design the, the materials, and then we have people that, uh, that need to deliver trainings or courses based on the material designed by, by others. So the, 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 the completeness of the instructor it is very, very important for the delivery of the trainings. It should contain the learning unit plan with the for the for the for each of the learning units. It should describe in details every activity that will be performed. We will have an activity later today by the end of the of the of the training. Here we should also pay a lot of attention on the assessment. So here we should discuss, we should have a description of the, or we should, have, we should have the content of the quiz bank, of the quiz question bank. So the questions needed, uh, recommended to assess this, this, uh, this um, learning unit, the strategies that can be used to build up the quizzes for this, the facilitation guide or how to, uh, how to implement, how to deliver this quiz. And of course, the feedback questions. We'll discuss about the feedback uh, uh, in, the, in the next session, next 
week. Uh, this is the proposed structure of the uh, learning materials that we use within the fair by design methodology. The idea is uh, we implement these structures, the structure using a GitHub repository. And the idea is to start from the root of the repository where we have a couple of couple of elements that are uh, that are mandatory by 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 the methodology, which includes some special files. Some of the files were mentioned by by Sonia earlier. So, uh, we will dive in deeper into some of those files later. The readme file, the license file, the citation, the code of contact, and then we have the resources, which means that we have for each of the of the sections we can have uh, the, the uh, sections in this uh, in the like we do have today in our training we have two actually sections that are for the day one and day two they can further be broken up into different modules and then each module has one or more learning unit and each of the learning unit has uh, same 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 uh, same um, structure each learning unit has uh, a learning content, which is a MD file that has the content itself, which is the, the key element, the key element of the, of the learning unit, but also it has a learning unit plan where we define what, how do we plan to deliver this uh, in time, uh, by looking at the, the, the time schedule, looking at the uh, means that we will use to present, should we use slides, should we use some questions, should we use any other uh, modalities. Uh, if there is a slide deck associated, it also should be part of the learning unit. Then the learning unit might have uh, activities within itself. They are placed in a separate folder, and each activity has a has, has a, a a separate a separate file for the description of these activities. If there is assessment associated with this. Uh, with this uh, uh, learning unit, there will be a folder called assessment containing the question bank and optionally the strategy if there is one. And then all the media files should be put in some uh, in some uh, in the attachment in the attachments folder. In the learning material, you will find the same structure in a similarly looking uh, diagram. But it's more important that this diagram is uh, uh, enables you to 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 get access to the templates that are already made for each of these elements, starting from the files at the root up to the examples of questions banks or or, or learning content or, or learning unit plans. You can access them through this scheme on the learning materials and download themselves download for yourself at the, at the, download the copies for yourselves at the at the GitHub. We mentioned the learning unit plan. It's very important element uh, the, of this, uh, the, to define it uh, properly because it contains all the aspects that should lead to a high quality learning experience. We try to address all the elements that can contribute to increasing the learning experience here in this file. It defines the plan on how to use the different teaching methods, how to use the learning content, where and when to use the activities to achieve the, the learning objective that you have previously defined. Uh, and uh, in general, there are differences between learning plans for online trainings versus the ones for the traditional workshops, because it's uh, mostly in the part of the activities. It's quite the, um, quite different to implement activities in the online sessions uh, in, uh, in on the con uh, compared to activities when you have a face-to-face a, a -face train. Uh, to define the, the, the learning unit plan, we recommend using the hunters model. And the hunter models is a model that consists of nine steps that will help you to better develop the unique the 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 the, the learning unit plan, it starts with the setting of learning objections. Means meaning that you have to answer the question, "What is the goal?" Then the next question is, "How do I get there?" Or identify the needs. Then share the agenda in the form of a plan. How to realize this? Then why is this content important within the hook element, the hook phase? Then how then make an instructions on how to do it. Of course, practice it. Help me do it. I'll watch you do it. Then wrap up 
or 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 uh, uh, wrap up the 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 content that you previously offered, and then evaluate and reflect on it. Uh, reflect to uh, reflection is quite important in this uh, in our methodology from from various aspects because it's provide us a mean to 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 uh, to enhance and improve our our materials. And finally, we have a learning unit plan. A learning unit plan uh, should have uh, some required elements that need to be part of, of it, uh, starting from the, the obvious ones like the unit name and the purpose of the, of the unit, the location, the duration, the expected number of, of attendees, the learning objectives, the plan by topic, duration, key points, teaching method, are there any activities that will be used? Will there be assessment? Is there a certification associated with this specific learning unit? And of course, at the end, a reflection discussion on how did we do it? Uh, for If you take a look at the repository, you will see at the GitHub repository, you will see the learning plan MD files for each of the learning units that are present. Of course, they are not uh, shown in the Gitbook pages because they are intended for the for the instructors, not for the learners. But you're welcome to look at the repository itself, and in the in the each uh, folder of each learning unit, you will see a learning unit plan uh, file that describes that has all these necessary elements. And then there is the learning unit notebook that will have the brief introduction, the learning objectives, the target audience, duration, prerequisite, tools, content, and summary. And of course, the suggested learning, suggested reading to complete somehow the picture for this. For each learning activity, it's important that you describe the learning activity in quite a lot of details. The activity name and short description to, should describe the activity, but also it's important to include the duration of the activity. How do you plan to do this by the number of people that will be that will be included into this activity? Is it a group activity? Is it an individual activity? Should we break up the groups? What are the goals that we need to 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 achieve with this activity? Are there any special materials that we need to do if it's a if it's an online uh, online workshop, do we need to have access to some tools? Or maybe if it's an on-site, uh, do we need to have some, I don't know, post-it notes or, 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 or a whiteboard to, to, you, to, to, to do this activity? Then a detailed instructions helping the instructor to deliver this activity. Of course, it's useful to include some tips and tricks, especially for the instructor. Sometimes these activities especially at the, the 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 beginning of the training activities early in the training and uh, people are not well uh, uh, comfortable enough to start the activities to engage so tips and tricks icebreakers can be very very helpful and then related sources and 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 comments on the activities can also help the the instructors or the the, the ones who are delivering the training successfully implement these activities we talked about the assessment as a very important part. We again get back to the Bloom's taxonomy um, to 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 make a selection of different types of of questions, starting from true false, multiple choice questions, uh, uh, up to up to quite more complex types of 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 questions like uh, multiple select or long answer or fill in the blanks or ordering answers, etc. Depending on what do you want to evaluate, uh, if needed, and if you are using some kind of a learning platform of your choice, it's always good to include assessment strategy on how to mix and match different types of of questions to better to better achieve achieve the the goal. So at the end, you have the complete learning unit, and it should contain the plan. The content, of course, is the most important element. The slide deck, if you are using slides or similar types of inter, uh, instructional materials, the description of activities, and the assessment quiz and strategy. Having this, uh, all these elements, you have now a complete picture, a complete uh, learning unit that is ready to be delivered to the to the learners. Uh, 
to help the, the 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 instructors to do so it's always a good idea to include the facilitation guide in the facilitation guide you address some very important questions like what to do what to do before during or after the training how should i best prepare for the training to be delivered where are all the materials that i need to use are there digital materials on location that are there any physical materials should i print um, uh, some some uh, some uh, sheets of paper or blank sheets of paper needed for the face-to-face -face training um, how do i prepare the materials uh, do i need flip charts do i need um, post-it notes etc for the for the training and of course how to prepare the learning environment is there an special room layout or any other specifications should we have a sign-in sheet should we use name tags to better identify uh, uh the the trainers etc or in case of the online trainings preparation of the virtual room access uh, publishing of reading materials etc etc at the end you need to collect the feedback uh, many activities in the fair by design methodology very much depend on the feedback collection first of all the continuous improvement and of course the co-creation there can be different types of, of feedback collection. We will discuss about the feedback a little bit later. Later in this, in this, in this, um, in this uh, training. So to wrap up this first part, again, a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is: What is the best location to keep the instructor notes for the slides? So what's your opinion? Where should we put the notes, the slide notes? Should we put it in the learning content file? or the lecture notes of each slide, or both? Yes, I think we have a convergence on A. And that's excellent. That's the that's the correct answer, answer. The learning content file is the right place to put all the instructor notes. Put yourself in my shoes now. I'm looking full screen at my presentation and don't have a second screen to, to see the lecture notes. And it's always good to have them in a separate location in a in a learning content content file, although uh, we are somehow used to put lecture notes on on each slide. It's always better to have them in a separate separate learning content file. And just another one, last one from my side. Which of the following are part of the complete instructor kit? There's the activity details, quiz question banks, instructors qualification, learning platform, or quiz strategies. Multiple answers, of course. Well. If, if we try to reflect on this, uh, activity details are very important to be described quite well in the complete instructors kit, along with the quiz question banks and the quiz strategies. As for the instructors qualification and learning platforms, I'm not sure that we can predefine them up front. It's very dependent on the specific delivery, on the specific um, instance of the training. So. I would stick to the A, B, and E in this case. Thank you for your, your input. So just to summarize, we spoke about the instructor kit, the, the structure of the materials and the templates provided for, for, uh, by, the, by the methodology to help you um, adopt this as easily and as, as uh, seamlessly as possible. The unit plan, the content of the of the uh, of the learning unit and of course at the end the facilitation guide so thank you uh that would be all from my side for this part of the of the of the training so up to now anastas took you on a journey through the prepare and the design stage we skip discover because i'm sure you're far better than us searching for materials that are relevant for your community so we didn't really talk much about it and we didn't touch it intentionally now we are going to switch to the produce stage so that means that you know the elements you know the schema you know the objectives, you have a syllabus, you have the structure. You know what you need to do. Now you need to develop content, right? This is the idea. So we are going to talk a little bit about the content itself and related to what we call rich learning experience. 
just be careful. I don't know if you noticed how many times Anastas used the word recommended, right? So the fair by design methodology is quite open to interpretation. Everything that we were showing you, the structure, the elements of the plan, of the content, of everything is just a recommendation. You can use it as inspiration and define your own structure. You can define your own elements and everything. Basically, the only mandatory thing so far is that you need to follow a schema that you will adopt. You need to create a structure that will be logical and easy to reuse. And you need to develop this whole instructor kit, right? Don't just do one content and that it, that's it, but also provide additional information about it so that it's easier for other people to, to be used. This is the main message. How you do it, it's up to you. You are free to use our recommendations. You see how they look like in practice. We develop these learning materials using the recommendations, but feel free to adapt them, to change them, to add elements, remove elements, change the structure, do whatever you want, okay? You're free to to do whatever you want now talking about rich learning experience we will talk about three different things the learning modalities why it's very important to introduce multimedia inside your learning content and of course accessibility because this is a part about the uh, learning materials that you cannot run away from and it's becoming even more and more important with the new laws that are being developed inside the European Union and in the different different countries. So learning modalities. I, I mentioned before that uh, you know different people when they learn, they process the information, they retain the information in a different way. and there are a lot of, psychological studies about learning and everything that show that there are actually four basic modalities about how people learn and how they interact with information. So some people are more towards <laughs> visual learning elements such as charts, images, diagrams. Some people like more auditory things such as audio recordings, podcasts, narrations with slides, videos. Um, some people are into reading and writing. I'm that person, for an example. I like detailed written explanations. I like interactive reading materials. And a lot of people, especially young people today, are very prone to kinesthetic modalities for learning. And this means doing something, right? Is it a simple drag, or drag and drop activity or maybe a more complex virtual lab using Jupyter notebooks and containers behind, depending on the on the content. When you are developing the learning content, it's important to understand from the beginning that your audience is white, right? And even today, when I say, okay, I'm more into reading, that doesn't mean that I'm only reading and not doing anything else. Usually people are complex beings, right? And they like to do different things in different ways. So um, the takeaway is that you need to cater to all of these four modalities. So try to incorporate all of these four things into your learning content. In this way, you will be sure that you are addressing every type of learner, that you're helping every type of people understand the learning content, learning content better. So, okay, in order to do that, right, I need to put diagrams, charts, virtual labs, stuff, and so on. That means I basically need to integrate multimedia inside the, the learning content. So in that case, in that way, I can cater to the different learning preferences. What kinds of and types of multimedia I can add to, to the content? I can add images. If you're adding images on the side of accessibility, make sure that together with the images, you always use descriptive alternative text in order to cater to people who have uh, visual disparities are not able to understand the image as well. Maybe they don't understand colors or maybe they don't understand the image at all. So descriptive alternative text is a mandatory thing for, for images. Sometimes it's easier to use icons instead of images. And in this way, your audience is wider because icons are more easily understood by everyone. 
but it depends on the context. So consider when it's more appropriate, you use icons. When it's not, then use uh, the image that is the most appropriate. If you are trying to, to use videos and type of, of types of multimedia, then um, there are two, two different ways on how you can do it. Uh, you can embed it inside the content, or you can provide links to the video. Whether you do one or the other, it will always depend on the context. It's usually preferred that you can embed the video content inside the, the whole learning content so that the learners don't have need to visit another place or something to watch the video, but uh, sometimes it might not be uh, be easy to do it. So in that case, you, you can provide links. Also consider using GIFs as a version of videos. Why consider using GIFs? Uh, it has been shown scientifically that uh, lately, especially these newer, younger generations, that they like short things, right? Very short, rich information that they can consume in very little time. So GIFs are the best, uh, basically, versions of, of videos in this way because they're quite short videos and uh, easy to consume on different uh, in different browsers with different tools and so on. However, longer videos, normal videos are also, also an option. It depends again on what you are de developing and how you're doing it. Don't forget uh, for videos and for audios, one of the most important things that you need to consider is that you need to include the transcripts. So for both video and audio, you also need to provide transcript in order to cater to people who have uh, accessibility, problems and you need to provide the controls. So it's not recommended that, for an example, you auto play the audio or the video content when you present the content to the learner. You give the controls to them so that they can play, they can pause, they can rewind, they can do everything to control the, the process of watching the video and listening to the, to the audio. The last element or type of multimedia that you can add is also interactive elements. Interactive elements are like buttons, uh, dragging stuff, and so on. They cater to the kinesthetic modality. And what you need to be careful about here is that, yes, in most of the browsers, they are supported. So support it. However, there are fine differences. So whenever you do this, make sure that you test the compatibility before providing it to the learners. So test with two, three different popular tools that the learner would use in order to access the content and check if it works fine, if the responsiveness is as it should be, just to make sure that uh, everything, is, everything is okay. The recommendation here is that it is great to, to provide a combination of all of these types of multimedia so that you can have a very, very wide audience in your <clears throat> um, among your learners or consumers of your learning content. So um, in conversations with uh, representatives from the acquiring community before we were preparing for, for this training, uh, we were told that Many of you are now trying to develop uh, markdown content and uh, Git pages similar to the ones that we provided for this training. So I was wondering, and maybe some of you would like to write in the chat, do you plan to add some type of multimedia or interactive content to the markdown? Have you done it before? Do you know how to embed images, videos, audio? interactive elements to mark down? Are you aware about other things that could be added inside? Yes, I see here that you tried with the video and yes, there was a problem uploading a, a long video on GitHub because long videos are usually very big files. And uh, GitHub uh, also has, you be careful when you use GitHub because it also has uh, this integrated settings of how big the files can be in maximum size when you're adding to the repository. So in these cases, when you have very big video files, our recommendation, if you're using GitHub for the repository and for the development of the Git pages is actually not to upload the very big video file 
into the GitHub repository, but use a specialized service for hosting videos. One example could be upload the video to YouTube, make it available only for people with the link so that if you don't want to, to, to make it publicly available and searchable through YouTube, and then use the embed YouTube feature in order to get the HTML code and embed this code in the markdown. In this way, you're not restricted with um, uploading the, the file to, to GitHub and um, you get the whole thing, the controls and the transcripts and all of these features that uh, YouTube uh, provides. It's just uh, one way of doing it. You can use another service uh, you can use your own uh, server that hosts multimedia files. Um, however, because of uh, these problems with GitHub, it's a, it's a good practice to, to host it somewhere else in a more specialized repository, uh, whether it's institution-owned or, or public or whatever, but specialized for multimedia, multimedia content. <laughs> Yes, Eleonora is, is uh, quite right uh, from an uh, effective learning perspective. It's usually recommended to cut long videos into shorter videos so that they can be consumed more easily or to enable this feature of marking chapters in a long video so that the learner can jump from one chapter to another chapter where a different content starts and uh, consume it in this way. If you are, I don't know if any of you have been using the big blue button system, webinar system. Uh, it's interesting that the recordings of trainings or, or giving lectures in the system when you do it. Afterwards, um, the system itself processes the, the video and synchronizes it with the slides if they are shared and creates these chapters and these jumps and uh, helps a lot for, for learners. and. Usually it comes with its own multimedia repository and then you can get a link to the video and then you can put this, embed this link into the markdown. So this is also an option. It's a free open source system. So you might look into this as an option as well. There are also other extensions in markdowns that are considered um, kind of multimedia interactive content. For an example, it's nice to use admonitions to track the attention of the learner to something important, like a tip, like a warning, like a, a more information, question, whatever. You can also use cards or tabs or code blocks. And Anastas will help me and put the link to the micro learning unit of Fair by Design to show you how uh, we have used these types of admonitions cards and tabs to create a visually more, let's say, friendly or attractive uh, content inside uh, using Markdown and using using Git pages. Um, if uh, some of you have also mentioned to me that uh, you like to do stuff like integrating Jupyter notebooks into Markdown, this is also possible, and it's possible to do it in different ways. The easiest way, but not so interactive, is to convert the notebook to a combination of Markdown and HTML and simply put it inside. But in this way, it will be static. If you really want to use a live notebook, then uh, you need to use something like Notebook Viewer or GitHub Guests, or use the Jupyter Book, which is a variation of Gitbook, Git Pages. Uh, that allows you to actually work with a um, combination of Markdown and Jupyter Notebooks and create this more interactive learning content. So there are options available and so all you need to do is to try them, test them, play with them and see what works best, best for you. In this section here, we will try to give you tips on what to do and what not to do. It's not like this is again mandatory, it's just recommendations and best practices. So it's up to you to adopt what you think will work for you, to ignore what you think is not going to work for you. One of the best practices is to, when whatever elements you decide to incorporate and so on, it's very important to maintain a consistent style, just uh, that it helps learners uh, easily understand what is important, what is less important, 
where to jump and so on. So stuff like consistent image sizes, consistent um, layouts of the captions and the positioning and everything helps people when they consume the content. I mentioned to you before, I'm mentioning it again, because when you add multimedia elements, there might be different rendering in different systems. It's always best practice to test the compatibility in different browsers to make sure that the design is really responsive, especially uh, to test it on different devices, such as phone, tablet, and laptop, or even a bigger screen, just to make sure that they work in different, in different environments. Um, it's also a best practice to provide a download link for the media. So if you decide to embed the video, also provide them with an option to download the video because uh, sometimes some people might have a problem with using the controls or something. It's easier for them to download it and to, to view it offline. And uh, if you're doing stuff like Jupyter Notebooks, of course, best practice is to provide documentation and guidelines, how to's for people, how to interact, how to use them, what to do, and, and so on. Compared to the do's, we also have a list of don'ts. So don't do too much. Too much is not good always. So don't put too much multimedia. When do you're doing multimedia, don't use low quality multimedia because it doesn't look well on high resolution screens. Uh, again, don't forget to test. Testing is very important. That's why we mentioned it uh, three or four times. Don't and never ignore accessibility. So please, alternative text, transcripts for videos, and make sure that the controls are keyboard navigable or these things that are required in order to say in the end that yes, you try to provide accessible content. Try not to use unreliable external sources. This is related to what uh, we were discussing before about where to host the multimedia long video. So choose a multimedia repository that you trust, that uh, the video will be there for the time period that you need it, that it won't just disappear tomorrow and you don't know what to do next. As I mentioned before, don't use auto playing media because of accessibility reasons. If you're reusing multimedia that someone else created, of course, you need to credit the source, you need to provide attribution and Never provide just the multimedia, always provide reading content before or after that discusses and describes the content of the multimedia itself. This will cater to the people that are more towards the reading modalities, but also to the people that are not able to process the multimedia, the image or the video. And they would, for example, they are using screen readers that will simply jump uh, through the video and uh, image and uh, only read the alternative text that you provide. So they need other type of written information in order to understand what was the content of the, of the multimedia and how it is important. So as you see, whenever we talk about content of learning materials, accessibility is quite an important uh, feature in there. And that's why in Fair by Design methodology, we extended the accessibility in fear with including accessibility of learning materials. Um, the idea is to never forget that you need to provide the content to the widest range of learning uh, variability. Some of them will use assistive technology, some of them won't use the assistive technology, but this is not the only point of accessibility. When we say accessibility to the widest range of learning variability, we also need to think about things such as the native language of the people that are going to consume the content, right? It's different when you prepare content in the native language of someone or when you expect someone to consume content in a language that is not their native language. Then you make sure that the language is more simple, easier to understand and so on so that um, you can represent the nuances better. We talked about the different learning styles. But there is also, for an example, think, the thing about the cultural background. Depending on the context that you're presenting, 
different people with different cultural background may understand it in a different way. So you need to make sure that you present it in the right way so that it is understood um, correctly by the people, the target audience that you defined in the, in the beginning. Some general guidelines on accessibility. Uh, we already said it's good to present the information in multiple ways and formats. It's all, always a best practice to use a simple language, not very long sentences and so on, so it's easier for people to understand. Using headings is a must in order to structure well the content and make sure that uh, people understand which parts belong to which section. Use a table of content so they can jump through easily. Always provide alternative text for images. If you're doing math equations, then use equation editors. Don't put them as images or something because screen readers don't understand them. Use a high contrast color palette. In this way, the images can be understood by people that have problems with uh, differentiating between different colors and shades. Don't use color as the only way to convey information. Because in this way, people that don't understand the difference in colors, they don't understand the image. Use descriptive links. Don't use something like click here or, or uh, say click here to what or go to what you want them to, to do or something like that. Use tables only when required. This helps screen readers format and read through the text more easily. And always with audio and video provide uh, closed captions and transcripts. Now, these guidelines, when you try to implement them in Markdown, you will see that it's, uh, it's not that hard to, to do it. For example, with Git pages, if you use headings, the table of contents will be done automatically. Uh, in Markdown, it's very easy to provide the alternative text for images. It is the thing that you put in the strong brackets after before the, the actual link. There is an extension that provides you with an equation editor for the types of images. You need to choose them by yourself. Um, for the tables, tables are very, <laughs> let's say, time consuming to to describe them in Markdown. So basically Markdown is making you not use tables so much, which is a good thing. And um, for the closed captions and transcripts, this uh, has to go together with the audio and video. When we talk about accessibility, I just need to mention to you that there are actually standards about these things that can be followed. Related to Markdown and to Git pages, the most relevant standard is the first one, which is was developed by the um, World 3 Consortium. The standard is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Um, 2.1 is the most widely version, used version today. However, the 2.2 version is already out there and now slowly people are, are moving to, to this version. Inside the standard, there are four principles, so rules, they divided into four groups. There is, a, for each rule, there is a defined success criteria that can be tested. And then depending on how many rules from the four sections you pass, you can get three levels, the low level, the mid level, and the high level. However, be careful to achieve a level means to have a 100% sec success on the test for the level. So even if one of the success criteria fails, so you have 99.9%, .9%, it's not compliant to the level. To be compliant, you have to achieve everything that is required by the level. Best practice is to try to achieve the double A, the medium level for for accessibility, we try to do this in the fair by design methodology. We use different types of tools to test the accessibility of the content that we produce in the Git pages. For PDF documents, for an example, there is a separate standard that defines the accessibility. It's uh, very similar to the previous one with a few tweaks that are uh, specific to, to PDFs. If you decide to achieve, let's say, AA conformance, the best way to test is to use a tool 
On this link here, you will find a list of tools that has been generated by the organization that developed the standard. Uh, on the left-hand side, there is a lot of filtering. You can even choose a tool that complies to the accessibility guidelines for a specific country, such as Germany, for an example, and see uh, tools that know how to check for the guidelines for that country. However, understand, please do understand that we, we use these tools, we played with them a lot and so on. The tool might tell you that you are 100% compliant, but in reality, you might not be 100% compliant. Why? Because there are some success criteria in the levels that are very, very hard to automatically check with a tool. So they skip through this success criteria. The tools only implement some of the criteria that are required, and they give you a report on the criteria that they check. They don't check everything, and that's why we say they're not almighty and we need to be careful, careful about this. So one of the most important things about this whole process is the alternative text, right? It's a bit of a science to write a good alternative text. It doesn't come easily. So these are some tips on what to do and what not to do. So it should be very accurate and equivalent representation of the content and the function of the image, but it shouldn't be very long. It should be concise and it shouldn't be redundant in the sense that there is a sentence and then you repeat the whole sentence in the alternative text. Best practice is not to include phrases such as this is an image of or this is a graphic of or so on. The screen reader already knows that it's reading alternative text for, for an image. If the image is purely decorative, then you need to leave the alternative text blank. Okay, this tells the screen reader this is a decoration, jump through it as if as if it doesn't it doesn't exist because it doesn't have a, a function. So overall, if you want to achieve a rich learning experience, please try to tailor the content to the different modalities enrich the content using multimedia, follow the do's and the don'ts, and make sure that you try to be as accessible as possible. If you want to achieve a standard, a level or something, then you can also put an accessibility mission to your learning materials, but this is not a requirement, right? It's uh, something that is nice to, nice to have. Okay, so... Now you know how to do the content as well. So text, multimedia, combination, accessibility, everything. One of the important things that you need to keep in mind while you're developing the content, you're still in the produce phase, is that when you are reusing existing learning material, you need to be very careful about licensing, what you can and cannot reuse, and attribution, what you decide to reuse has to be attributed. It's, it's not always mandatory, it's a must from a moral, moral perspective. So we'll go through a little bit about the licenses, what can and cannot be reused, what can be reused in, in, in what way, and then talk about attribution. How, what is the best way to attribute, how to attribute and finish with how you let others know how to attribute you or how to cite your, your work. So if you want to reuse something, then the content must be available under a permissible license. So you need to search for the license of the content, check if this license allows for reuse. Only then you can reuse the content. And now you will say, okay, but there is so much content on the internet and I cannot find the license connected to this content. True, it's so true today. However, the rule in this situation, so if it's not, the if the license is not available or the license is not permissible and you still would like to use it, then the only thing you can do is reach out to the owner of the content and ask for permission. Only if you get permission, you can reuse it. 
there is a little gray area allowance here in the case where you have a content without a license, without a publicly visible license, and you ask for permission, you don't receive an answer after a reasonable amount of time, you can reuse it. However, the owner has the right at any point in time to send you a mail, contact you in any way and say, remove my content, I, I don't allow you to reuse it. And then you have to listen to him and do this because uh, it's their right to, to do it. So basically what you can do with no license and no permissible license is only cite the content and you're clear there. However, citations are using very, very small amount of the content just for a, an example or something. It's not reusing the, the whole thing. That's why our recommendation is it's uh, the most easy if you stick to content available under the Creative Commons or similar licenses. And even then you need to be careful. And I will tell you now why you need to be careful. These are the types of the Creative Commons licenses that uh, are out there. So you're searching for content with some of these licenses. Be careful. If the licenses include no derivatives, that means that you have to use the content as it is. You cannot change anything. You cannot translate it. If it's an image, you cannot even crop it. Nothing as it is, you're not allowed to, to make any, any, any type of change. The other thing is that if it belongs to this non-derivative group, you cannot mix it with something else. The place where you, you reuse it, you reuse the content as a whole, and you don't add from other places, you don't mix in it with your uh, content or whatever. This is only that part, the non-derivative part that belongs to someone else and that's it. These are the rules that you have to abide with. The non-commercial one is important. If you're creating materials for which someone pays, then you cannot reuse non-commercial content. And if you're using something with a share alike license, you need to be careful if you reuse a lot of this material. For example, you take a whole course, which is share alike, and then you do make some adaptations, changes in order to uh, generate a new version that you will use for some training. In that case, the license of your content needs to also be share alike. It cannot be something else. So basically when you reuse under Creative Commons, there are two, two use cases. The first one, combining. In, uh, when you do combining, you combine smaller pieces from different sources, which may be available under different licenses. You can combine any CC license content you want. So any combination of the licenses that you saw before, as long as you provide the attribution and you comply with the non-commercial part, if there is non-commercial, and you comply with the no derivatives if there is no, de no derivative. But this means that in your big learning material, you're using small pieces here and there to make a point, to show an example, to talk about some small topic. This is not the main theme of your learning material. If we are talking about the main topic of your learning material and you use something to support it, in that case, we are talking about remixing and adaptation. And in this case, you are creating a new version of an already existing original form. You have to abide to the rules in that case very carefully. So that means that you need to use this table to check what kind of licenses you can mix together and what you cannot mix the access. And then when you decide on your license, which is now called the adapter's license in the end, only the green fields here are acceptable. You cannot really invent a license by yourself. It depends on the original license of the status of the original work that you used as the basis of your work. So to summarize, it's much easier to do combining 
and we recommend you to do combining. Be very, very careful, and it's best to consult with a legal person if you're trying to do your mixing, because there are a lot of rules that you need to abide to. Now, you did the whole licensing thing, you know what you're going to reuse and everything. In the places where you are reusing this content, you have to provide attribution. It doesn't matter what license it is, it's a moral right. So even if it is public domain, CC0, you have to provide attribution. How you provide attribution? The rule is if the original author has a preferred way for attribution. So on the original site where you found the content, there is how to cite, what to do, and so on. You use this. If there is no such thing, then the preferred way to attribute is using the so-called TASL method. The TASL method is actually the so-called ideal attribution where you provide the title of the work, the author of the work, the source, where can the original work be found, and the license under which the original work has been released. These are the four elements that you need to, need to provide. There are many cases in practice that some of these four elements might be missing. In this case, you have no other alternative but to skip that part. It may be an unknown author, or there might be no title, or, or something similar. So. In that case, you do the best you can, right? But this is the, the most preferred, preferred way. So these are some examples of how you do attribution. What you need to, to, to focus on here is, for an example, when you're, when you're doing adaptation, of course, the original license has to allow derivative. After the attribution, you say what you changed. For an example, this text here, sorry, cropped from original. Or when it is provided by the source, you use the way the source would like you to attribute. For an example, this is the last point where you have an example how to attribute an image from Pixabay, which is a repository of, of uh, free images. They, on their side, they say, if you want to attribute, you have to use this format for the, for the attribution. When you are attributing an image, of course, it has to be available under a permissible license. The text should be under the image. So you see here where the arrow points, this is the attribution to the image that you see before. And you have to have attribution for all of the images that you are uh, reusing in your presentation, your learning content in, in whatever it is. The same goes for music and for video. So under the multimedia content, you provide the attribution with small letters uh, with the using the TASO model or the way that uh, the author preferred if, uh, if it's available. Uh, what about attributing uh, content, learning content into a larger collection, right? So you found a module, you found a section that you would like to use inside the module whatever. Um, the best practice here is to provide the attribution at the beginning of the section, right? So for an example, if it's in a slide deck and some slides are taken from somewhere, then on the first slide, before these reused slides, you will have this attribution here that says this section is based on title, author, source, license. This is the idea. If derivatives are allowed and you changed something, after the attribution, you say what you changed. For an example, you, re you rewrote some of the bullets or something like that. If you took the original material, however, you combined it with your own material or uh, you wrote something by yourself, in that case, you say this section contains material taken from there and there. What are the changes? And in the end, you say, and adding original material, because some of the stuff are, are done by, by yourself. If you want to attribute to materials from multiple sources, the best practice is to be clear which attribution belongs to which work. So before every source that you're reusing, you put the attribution. This part is from there, that part is from there, the, that 
third parties from from there. Don't put one attribution where you say this whole part it contains parts from here, 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 here. It's not clear which part is from where. It should be clear which part is taken from where. This is the main main rule. For example, if you reuse a full slide from somewhere, you see the, the small text below that says slide from there and there by that and so on. Another best practice, and you should be careful about this, is if there is copyright available, and copyright is that part with the C icon after the C icon, this must be included in the attribution. So if you see somewhere copyright something, something, you have to add it inside the attribution. This is a legal rule and you cannot go, cannot go around it. The new stuff about attribution and citing is now that attribution is also required for AI generated content. For an example, if you have an AI generated image, it's best practice to provide attribution as in the example here, you need to provide the prompt and the name of the used AI engine. It's a similar also for AI generated text. You need to provide the tool that you use, the prompt that you use, the date when you use the tool, the name, the creator, and the version of the AI tool. So think about these things if you're using AI engines to, to create some of the learning content. Finally, just to make a distinction between reusing and attribution and citing, you can cite any type of license, it doesn't have to be permissible for reuse. However, when you cite the amount of information that re you reused, you quote it, has to be very limited. What is very limited? It's a very gray area. Somewhere it says something like maximum 100 words, but it might differ from country to country. So be very careful here. It depends on the context, on the country, for what is it going to be used. If it is academic context, it's easier. If it's not, it's very hard. In the end, try to avoid it or consult with a legal expert if you want to, if you want to do it. The final thing, you attributed everything. Uh, now you need to tell people how to cite your own work. For this, our recommendation is to use the citation file format. It's also used by Zenodo, for an example, and for and other repositories as well, scientific repositories. Uh, this is that means that in the repository in the root, you will create a separate file which is called citation CFF. And inside this file, you will provide the full information, the title, the authors, the version, the dates, the keywords, and everything. This link here is a project that is like a wizard that helps you generate a CFF, or if you already have a CFF file, it can check and validate it for you because there is a specialized schema and structure on how to define a CFF. You can see how a CFF looks like in our template repository for FAIR by Design, FAIR by Design materials.